Interview of Mr. Robert Warren Goldman, 23 January 2001, Syracuse Armory. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert von Hassel. Videographer is Mr. Wayne Clark. Well, Mr. Goldman, tell me where you were born and raised. Well, April 23rd, 1921. I was born in Manhattan, New York City, and uh, was raised in New York until I was 11. Family then started a trek up a lot of places. Uh, Buffalo, I graduated high school in East Orange, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and went on to college in New Haven, Connecticut. I graduated Yale in 1941. Okay. Well, where were you when Pearl Harbor was born? My family, we, my mother, dad, and my brother, we were in uh, our apartment in New York City in Manhattan listening to the New York Giant Brooklyn Dodger football game mm -hmm. and that Sunday and uh, listening to all the excitement at the polo grounds where they were starting to call uh, all kinds of uh, officers. It was later until we found out why they were being paged. What do you remember thinking at the time? I had no idea what was going on because, frankly, I asked my dad, I says, where's Pearl Harbor? He says, I don't know. I says, who owns it? We didn't even know that it was, that it was an American uh, base. So how did you come to be in the Navy? Well, for a very good reason. My dad was in the Army in World War I, and he says, if you decide to do anything, don't go in the Army. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I, in fact, actually, I had a defense job. I was. Uh, in New York City, manufacturing aeronautical spark plugs. And uh, I, I was deferred for the war, but in April of 43, I decided that's not what I wanted to do. So I went down to uh, 90 Church Street and signed up for the Naval V-7 program. And they, eventually they called me to uh, Columbia University, where I went through what we call the 90-day wonders. And uh, in December the 2nd of Forty-two. I was commissioned as an ensign in the Navy, and on December the 10th, I reported to my ship, the USS Charles Carroll, a ship I stayed with until, uh, uh, let's see, it must have been around May. No, it was earlier than that, in, when I finally was released from her after I had made uh, five invasions with her. Now, tell me a little more about the uh, Navy V-7 program. Uh, that was one in Columbia? Well, there were two. There was one at Columbia and there was one in the Midwest. Normally, the people who lived in the East were sent to the one in the Midwest for some unknown reason. I went to Columbia. And I, so I went to, I went to war in a taxi cab. <laughs> and uh, so I was, that's where I got my commission. So you went home every night? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> no. We had our quarters there. In fact, I lived in a bit building what is known, I guess it's still called Fernald Hall. That's where my quarters were. No, we certainly did not go home every night. So we had a crash, Annapolis, a four-year Annapolis course in 90 days. Mm -hmm. But of course, having been college graduates already, a lot of the basics we had already studied. And, and was Columbia University still going on in session? Well, yes. So how did you uh, interact with the students? Had very little to do with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we were kept pretty separate. First of all, our classes were quite rigid and lengthy. Uh, we, we had very, very little contact with, with these students at Columbia. The only nice thing about being there was because of the travel restrictions, the Yale-Princeton the Yale football game that fall was held at Bakerfield, Columbia, so that neither school would have to travel too far. So I was able to sneak out and see the game. <laughs> Now, there was an old battleship that was moored. Yeah, yeah the Prairie State. Mm -hmm. She was moored down, down at the, on the Hudson River. <coughs> and the, uh, happily, I, we, only t we only went aboard her once to do a lifeboat drill because that th ship was, was a horror. It, it was rat infested and was filthy, and I'm so happy that we were not assigned to the Prairie State. Others were? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was used just as a sink. A complete midshipman class was held, lived on the Prairie State. And the ship was in bad shape? Very bad shape. And um, where was it moored? Do you remember? On the Hudson River. Uh, where the exact location? I'd say somewhere, I'm just guessing now, in the upper 90s, lower 100th Street off the, off the uh, coast there. 
Mm-hmm. So after you graduated the V-7 program, you were assigned to the USS Charles Carroll. Mm-hmm. She was an APA, which is an auxiliary personnel assault, which means that we carried invasion barges, the smaller craft that you see in all the movies that made the initial landings on all the beaches. Mm-hmm. We had 30 on Well, we had, let's see, we had two gigs on board, a gig and a barge, because we had a Commodore on board. So the Commodore's boat was known as a barge, the captain's is known as the gig. And uh, we also had four tank lighters, which were small landing craft, but with, which were rather large, I should say, but would take small tanks. And the rest of the boats were personnel boats. Was this basically like a Liberty or a Victory ship that had been? This, was, uh, this ship was originally being built to be the De Uruguay. She was going to be a, a, a banana boat and was a little more of a luxury boat than the, Liber- than the, uh, the other boats that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was a, a much nicer ship than the, either the Liberty or the Victory ships. So she was somewhat different than the other APAs? Yeah, it, we had uh, two sister ships, but each APA was a totally different ship. They were, not, they were ships that were commandeered out of uh, the, the existing fleets. But ours was, when it was taken, was not even completed. It was originally to be the De Uruguay, when they named it the Charles Carroll. And uh, before I went aboard, she made the invasion of Fidela in North Africa. I did not make that invasion. She came back from Fidela, and, and I, made, I came aboard and did the others. So where did you come aboard? I boarded, boarded her in Norfolk, Virginia. And what were your initial duties? As a young ensign on board, I was what they called a deck officer in charge of just the deck itself, and I was also a wave commander. In other words, during the actual assaults, they would put a certain number of boats in the water. I had seven of them, of the, and uh, my, I would be in the center one, leading the seven boats in on the wave. At Sicily, I led the seventh wave in on the invasion. At Salerno, I led the fourth wave in. By Normandy, I was now the assistant navigator and stayed aboard the ship. And immediately after Normandy, I became the navigator. And I took the ship down for the southern France invasion and then out into the Pacific for the Okinawa invasion. So much different duties later on um, yeah. as a navigator as opposed to oh, yeah. being a small. I love being the navigator. Why? Well, first of all, I love mathematics. It's one of my favorites. I've done it. I've studied. Today, if you ask me a, a problem in calculus or solid geometry, I probably wouldn't even recognize it. But I did very, very well in all those courses in mathematics. I love math. And uh, how did you feel being a, a young officer and a Yale graduate, uh, as in being a small boat officer? I know other officers like. It was a, a step in the next along the line. I had. My, I had contemporary of college grad officers in doing this similar duty on board, and we progressed together. So there ne- was never a feeling of like, why not? I'm on a, why aren't I not on a battleship or a PT boat or none of none at all. So, what was life like aboard an APA? It was, it was uh, comfortable. We had very little to, to do when we weren't actually working for combat. Uh, keeping the ship clean. We were in interesting ports. I spent a lot of time in uh, in, uh, Merzel Kabir in uh, North Africa. And uh, and we spent time in various ports uh, because being on that ship, I spent time up in Glasgow, uh, well, not in Glasgow, but in Loch Long, which is, there we would take the train into Glasgow on Liberty. So we saw a lot of the world. The reason we got to the Atlantic was that my original uh, orders were to take the ship, were to be on the ship. We were heading for the Australia when we left Norfolk. But as, as we got within sight of the canal, we hit a mine, and it blew the screw off the ship, with a single screw ship, and killed two men that were sitting on the fantail. They disappeared, never did find them. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we were the only ship in history that I know of that's ever been towed through the Panama Canal completely out of commission. When we, because the dry docks on the Atlantic side were not big enough for us, so we went into the, they put us in dry dock in the, on the Pacific side, and uh, 
So for two months, we had a ball. We'd go, we had nothing to do but go fishing and kick the small boats out, and we had a, a, a fantastic time. When the ship was repaired, they decided not to have us join the Pacific Fleet, but to rejoin the Atlantic Fleet. So under our, this time, under our own power, we went back through the canal and uh, came back up the coast to Norfolk and uh, rejoined the Atlantic Fleet. And from where the, from there, where did you go? Well, that was where the, the, our next was through the Mediterranean, which was an interesting thing too, because the, we had troops on board now, and as we went through the Strait of Gibraltar, we had 1,500, well, 1,200 troops and about 500 sailors all running to the port side of the ship to look at the rock. We damn near turned over, <laughs> but uh, we had to call general quarters to straighten out the ship. But uh, so we went into the into the uh, Mediterranean, mm -hmm. and that's where we trained for the invasion of Sicily. Crossing the Atlantic at that time, we, we, were you not concerned about German submarines? Oh yeah, but we had escorts. We had we had destroyer escorts, and uh, we used a uh, zigzag patterns and uh, had no great, no great problem with it. The ship's routine much different with all uh, the soldiers on board? With the soldiers on board? Uh -huh. Oh yeah. It's, uh, it was, we were crowded and uh, for, for one thing uh, we didn't eat as well because we had to feed the soldiers and we didn't want to feed them too good. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, 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 was, it wasn't often that we had troops on board. When they were on board, it was a question of taking them on board and then d discharging them somewhere. So you got to the Mediterranean and you were busy training for the invasion of Sicily. Sicily. Tell me about that. Tell me about the invasion of Sicily. Well, the, pro the big problem with Sicily was weather. Well, when, that was one of the small boats. Incidentally, I don't know, it, you know, the boats are never loaded on sh board ship and then lowered. Uh, only the crew, a four-man crew, are in the boats when they put them in the water. The rest of us all go down cargo nets, climb down into because the, there's too much strain on the boats and on the gear. So, and, and the weather was bad. Those boats were bouncing pretty good, and uh, but it, it eased up a little. And of course, we would uh, we formed up our waves. That's what we called the various groups that went in, and. Uh, Watch the. We had some battle, the old battleships from Pearl Harbor were there, but they were bombarding the beach, and we had a. They they uh, beat it up, and then we we went in and hit the beach. We, uh, had no great problem once we hit the beach, got our troops off, and uh, went back for and reinforcements and came in again. Mm -hmm. It must have been quite an operation, though, the invasion of Sicily. We were there for four days. It took us four days to unload everything. The, the worst thing was there was so much, a lot of <coughs> disorganization. For example, one night uh, we had an air raid, and uh, most of the air raids when the Germans would come over, they would drop flares. That they would come at night, drop flares, and stay above the flares so you couldn't see them, and just bomb it indiscriminately. They did hear it hit us a. a uh, the ship not too not too far from us and they, uh, they blew up pretty good, but uh, with the one particular night while the, while the flares were coming down, a formation of B-17s, American ship planes flew over us and they, they had no business being there. They should they knew where the where our area was, and we opened fire on them, we shot down a few of them. I right, heard something like that had happened with C-47s. Yeah. Well, that, the C-47 uh, is the, was the cargo designation for them. The same, yeah. That's what they were, they were C C-47s. In fact, we picked up one crew that had managed to bail out. They came aboard ship, and they were ready to beat up everybody on board until we came, took them down to the, the wardroom and fed them. When they saw the food that we had aboard ship, they quieted them down because they hadn't eaten like that in a long time. <laughs> so you guys ate very well. Oh, yeah, we ate well. You said there was a lot of confusion. But did that have to do with the combat loading of the uh, of the ship? No, I think it was just a question of uh, communications more than that, than that. Were there any special preparations taken in terms of the way the ship was loaded 
in terms of what would have to go out first and second. Oh, I'm sure that that was not in my bailiwick, but uh, I'm, I'm certain that, that that was not. Now, taking the seventh wave into Sicily, uh, this is the first time you've been in combat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, was there still German uh, air and, and oh, artillery yes. act? Oh yeah. In fact, uh, we had we had one thing happen. Uh, we were by ourselves coming and going in, because once the waves were in, then it was a question of just going in. And uh, we saw a German uh, dive, a Stuka, dive on us, on our boat. But uh, two Spitfires showed up out of nowhere and cut them in half. And I'll tell you, you know, it's, it's quite an experience to see that, because our, uh, we had no way of fighting, of defending ourselves with a lousy 30 millimeter uh, machine gun, uh, 30 caliber machine gun. 30 caliber. But uh, I was in the museum in Australia as a tourist years later and saw one of these Spitfires hanging from the ceiling. And my wife couldn't understand why I took one look at that thing and I ran out. I couldn't, I got so choked up see, seeing that spit there because no spit, no me. Mm -hmm. What were you thinking when you were running into the beach? I mean, were you concerned about mines or artillery or? Uh, I guess when you're young enough and to, it's, it's looking back, I can't imagine that really we were that upset. Or really, it, the only time that I can ever remember having a little shake in the knees was at Salerno, and that's the because Salerno was a joke. That was the pardon the expression, but that was the only invasion I was in that was run by the army, and uh, General Clark did a horrible job, and Mark Clark, for one reason. At, at 6 p.m. that evening, 1800, as we were going in, going up the coast towards Salerno, the word came over that Premier Bidaglio of Italy surrendered to the Allied forces, and that instead of a, an invasion, it was going to be an occupation. Some of the soldiers on our ship didn't even want to bother carrying guns. They were, going to, they were looking for candy bars to go ashore to fight with the natives. The, uh, we were going to go into Naples and unload at the dock. When the word came that with well, there are too many ships, there's too much, we, we, Naples couldn't handle it, go through the invasion as though it was still an invasion. Well, the first two waves went into the beach. Nothing happened. The Germans were waiting. They let the first two waves land. When the third and fourth wave started in, all hell broke loose. And I was in the fourth wave. And I'll let you uh, for that one. And I'll tell you something, the knees shook. I didn't expect to come out of that one alive. What was going on? Well, they were shooting at us. In fact, I, I called back, I radioed back to the ship that I was not going to go into the assigned beach. It's impossible. I was going to swing a little farther to the north and try to get in. And I got the OK, and I did. And I was able to land the troops there. The, that evening, we got word that we were going to get ready to evacuate all the troops. And we knew that was going to be a hell on earth. Even the, uh, but just as we were getting, making preparations for that, the word came that the beach was being held. And instead of that, make a fast run back to Africa for reinforcements. So we hauled up the, the anchor and took off, went back to uh, Oran in Algeria. And uh, the naval base is called Merz El Kabir at Iran. Mm -hmm. And we loaded reinforcements and went back. Do you remember what army unit you were taking ashore? I think it was the 45th, the members of the 45th Division. At Sicily, I, be at, it I believe it was the 36th. It's, I, I may have had them reversed, but uh, I, I know we handled both the 36th and the 45th Divisions. Now, how did the soldiers take it? How were they acting on the run-in? The troops? Yeah. Uh, many of them were seasick. None of them were happy. And uh, we couldn't wait to get them the hell off the boats. <laughs> any, any difference between uh, the reactions at Sicily and the reactions at uh, Salerno? Not that I can remember. The best, the worst reaction we had was at Okinawa, we took in Marines. And uh, that was not a happy occasion. The Marines, they, they, they were careless aboard ship. They were, 
they left our ship like a pig pen. We, didn't, we never had that relationship with anyone else. <coughs> we were more than happy to get rid of the Marines. So what happened after the, uh, the fourth wave at Salerno? I mean, you went back, you got the reinforcements. And then we went back in, and, yeah. uh, and the beaches what? were held. And we, after, after that, we finally went back to North Africa, waiting for further orders. Uh, can I be a little bit silly? Sure. Because we had a, the, we were the, the commandant of the of Division Three was aboard our ship, the Commodore, and his name was Watson Osgood Bailey. So we sang a song to him. About five or six of the officers got together and were singing, "Oh, won't you go home, Oh Bailey? Won't you go home?" I won't finish the rest of that, but uh, that was. And shortly after that, we did. Yeah. <laughs> so it's back to the United States. Yeah. Back to Norfolk. What happened? At, what refitting there? Or? Yeah, refitting, uh, getting new supplies, kept you know cleaning up the ship, the one thing or another, and uh, we then went up to New York Harbor, and uh, that's where we loaded up when we went back, uh, back over again, and to this time we went up to uh, Scotland, and we spent a bit of time up in uh, Loch Long. And uh, there, before we went down to the Bill of Portland, which is the lower part of England, and it was from there that we sailed across the channel for the Normandy invasion, Omaha Beach. What did you load up in New York Harbor? Been, when you were in New York, what did you Hobo, load up? Hoboken on the Jersey side. Yeah. What, were you loading troops or? Yeah. Yeah. And you kept the same troops on board all the way down to the Normandy invasion? I think we discharged them. No, no, no. We discharged them in England. We did, we did, we were empty all the time we were up in Scotland, mm -hmm. and then we didn't reload until we got down to the Bill of Portland. Okay. Yeah. Now, when you were down there, order came down for uh, D-Day, and uh, everybody loaded up on uh, June the fourth. We fourth. loaded on June, pretty much June the third or fourth, because D-Day was June fifth, and uh, we actually. We're getting ready to go over, but the weather was so bad that we were turned back, and D-Day was changed to June 6th, which is interesting because most people, oh, when you hear the word D-Day, automatically think of the Normandy invasion. But every invasion was D-Day. D stood for the day of the invasion. Correct. They did up until then. Yeah. Um, where were you when you got the order to turn around uh, on the first? the first go around in Normandy. Were you already out in the channel? Uh, I, we were just singling up our lines. I don't think we had already left the, I don't think we had got left the dock yet. Mm -hmm. We had a new type of uh, equipment on board that's rather interesting called Queen Howe. The Queen Howe equipment was, was a, uh, a navigational equipment that the British had designed. And it, it had about a 40 mile radius. We had that on board. And of course, we all carried barrage balloons. We each one, each ship had a barrage balloon. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much value it was, but it was. Uh, made, I, all the time I was at, we were only at Normandy a short time. Uh, after we lo unloaded our troops, uh, we were only there till about 1600 in the afternoon, and went back. We were not there. For, we were not there 24 hours. That was the shortest time in any area, and it, during all that time. Never saw a German plane. The uh, just a question of getting out of there and getting back to England, and almost immediately we uh, formed up and went down to uh, the Mediterranean again to hit Germany, hit uh, France on the lower bottom near near Marseille. Mm -hmm. well, what was that like? How was that like? Mm -hmm. uh, very little opposition ashore. But we did have aerial opposition, and uh, this was the first time that we can remember we, that the Germans had some uh, jet planes up in the air. They also had, had some radio-controlled bombs, and uh, we had expected them. And we had uh, gear on board our ship that could divert those radio bombs, huh? and we were actually were able to do that. The only problem is we dropped one of them on one of our LSTs. <laughs> That was probably the end of the LSD. Oh, yes. 
I never knew that we knew about those guided bombs. I thought. Yeah. They, they, we had a special uh, of the bulkhead, not bulkhead, what am I thinking? Uh, a room built up on top of the bridge with special equipment for that. So they, they, they were anticipating what they like. <coughs> when we were in the Pacific, I'm jumping around a little bit, uh, we went back. We went, uh, after we were all done in the European theater, we went back through the canal up to San Francisco. And we were in San Francisco for uh, New Year's Day. Mm -hmm. In fact, I went to the, the football game on New Year's Day up in mm -hmm. San Francisco. And uh, we were there for a little while. Then we, we sailed from San Francisco with not in convoy, just our ship, nobody else. And we sailed to Espirito Santos down in the New Hebrides. It's a long ways away. And it, uh, the trip was over 50 days. And I never saw another ship all that time. But we did zigzag patterns uh, while we were going down there. And uh, we took a terrible beating when we crossed the equator. There were very few of us aboard the ship who were but they were shellbacks who had been there before, and they gave the rest of us a rough time <laughs> crossing the equator. I have my certificate. And uh, from, we got down to Espirito Santos, and then from there we went over to Guadalcanal, because Guadalcanal was, it was ours by that time, and uh, we did some training at Guadalcanal. And from there we went to Bougainville and did some training there. And then from there, we headed up to Ulithi Atoll. And that's where we picked up er, uh, Ernie Pyle and uh, loaded up there. We spent two weeks at Ulithi until, the, until we formed up to make the run on Okinawa. Now, did uh, Ernie Pyle ride with you uh, from Ulithi to uh, Okinawa? Yes. Were you, were you transporting part of the 77th Division at that point? I don't remember. I, I believe they were, they were Marines. They were Marines. They were Marines. And what the designation is, I don't remember. But he went aboard in uh, Ulysses and... Uh, he came aboard at uh, Ulysses. Right. And spent two weeks aboard. Okay. And then you, uh, you put him on... Uh, he went ashore our, at our landing boats. And he went ashore with the troops. Are you get a chance to spend any time with him? Oh, a lot of time with him. What was it like? Oh, he was a fine fellow. Uh, full of anecdotes from the European theater, for which we could uh, understand, because having spent so much time over there ourselves. He spent most of his time, however, with the enlisted personnel. He, didn't, he spent as little time as possible with the officers. He, he was an enlisted man's war correspondent. So you never got to, your family never got to see your name in Address in the paper at home. Huh? He mentioned the Carol, but never no. He uh, when he came aboard the ship, he had two big satchels with him, without without a stitch of clothing in. They were they had bottles in them, oh. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we outfitted them pretty well. <laughs> Drinking on a U.S. naval vessel? Well, it's been it's been known to happen. I had a safe in my. Since I was the navigator, I had a private stateroom up on the bridge with a, with a safe and all that. And I managed to keep a few things tucked away. So what about the uh, landings at, uh, at Okinawa? Tell me about those. Uh, there was no big problem where we were because the, we had done something that really turned out to be a, a, a big mistake. We had bombarded the southern tip of Okinawa and made a fake landing there two days before the actual landing. It drew all the Japanese troops down to that part of the island so that where we went was relatively clear. Unfortunately, that part of the island that we drew them down to was where all the burial caves were. And once, we got them, once they got in there, you couldn't get them out. So uh, one of the things uh, the first troops that went ashore all wore gas masks because there was a uh, building up on the, on the beach that we were told through our intelligence was a gas factory making uh, poison gases. 
And so uh, that we bombarded that, and it turned out to be a sugar refinery. It had nothing to do with poison gas at all. So how long were you in the uh, area of uh, Okinawa? I spent about four, four days there, four, four full days, maybe five. The, we saw an awful lot of kamikazes. Happily, we weren't hit with any of them. But uh, we saw a lot of kamikaze planes coming. And, uh, they, didn't, they didn't come close to your ship? Oh, yeah, well, they hit a couple that not, not too far from us. Mm -hmm. We saw them close enough to see them. But happily, because we were not evidently one of their targets, or they never got close enough. So we were not. Well, actually, except for that uh, mine that went off in the, uh, at the canal zone early, that I mentioned earlier, uh, our ship was pretty well unscathed. Now, after that, where did you go? After Okinawa? Uh, we came back, and on the way back, that's when we heard about uh, the President Roosevelt dying. We went to uh, Saipan and stopped there, but then stopped at, uh, at Hawaii and then went on back into San Francisco, and that's where I got off. Is that where you were uh, discharged? No. The uh, fellow who was supposed to relieve me, I got my orders to be relieved when we were down, at es down in um, Guadalcanal. But I had to wait for my relief. He never showed up. So when he didn't show up, I made the Okinawa invasion, and I was sure I was going to get killed there because I wasn't supposed to be there. But uh, when I got back to San Francisco, I went looking for him. Turns out he was up in the hospital, up in uh, uh, just, uh, the, I forget the, uh, the base, the hospital base, just up above San Francisco. And I went up there to meet him. And he was playing tennis. He was fine. I says, for Christ's sakes, get Get back to, relieve me. So he, he checked himself out and did. His name was Lieutenant Schulman. So you missed the typhoon off of... Uh... When, uh, the, well, let's, let's put it this way. After I got off the ship, I was ordered to take command of the USS Cybell, which is a supply ship, AK-10. And uh, the war ended while I was in San Francisco. So uh, I wanted to get out there so I could get on something, so I could get off something. So uh, they said to shoot, 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 eight, the Cybell was at Okinawa. So they put me on a victory ship, the USS Berwyn, not the USS, the SS, <coughs> Berwyn Victory. <coughs> and I went out on the Berwyn Victory. And uh, I was the only naval man aboard, because just as I went aboard, they took the gun crew off. No need for it. And I, they put me aboard as cargo security officer because of, to check the locks on the... That's, that was my only job. Once every day I'd walk the lock and check the lock. So uh, we got as far as Ulithi. And there that we were told to wait for further orders because we were bringing out aircraft parts for planes that were being sent back to the States. So while we were at Ulithi, <coughs> that typhoon, that the famous typhoon, hit Okinawa. Uh, so we didn't see any part of that. Finally, we went. To, we got orders since we had mail on board to go to continue on to Okinawa. So we went on to Okinawa. When we got there, the place was leveled. Was, I, uh, I went up. I, I left my ship to Berwyn Victory and reported for duty. They put me in a tent, and I'm not used to living in a tent. I like my own private cabin. And uh, so the next morning I said, I'm not staying here. Well, you got to, until we find out where your ship is, you're staying here. I said, no, no. You, there's still cargo on my, on the Berwyn Victory, and I'm in charge of it. I'm staying with the Berwyn Victory. So the fellow says, well, you've been through enough already. He says, go ahead, get back on the Victory. So I went back on the Victory ship, and uh, she sailed back, eventually she sailed back to the States, and I got off there. When I got to, when I got to uh, San Francisco, I went up, reported for duty, and he says, oh, the, the, your ship is at Pearl Harbor. We'll ship you there tomorrow. I said, wait a minute, how are, the, how are the points? Well, you haven't got quite enough points to get out, but I, they sent me to see the rear admiral, 
and he said, I'll change your orders. You'll make one trip out to the Philippines as, as executive officer on a transport, and, bring you, and when you get back, you're out. He says, okay. And so, because once as, as captain of the Cybel, I don't know when the hell I'd ever get off. So uh, I said, this was this, uh, early December, December 2nd to 3rd, something like that. So we said, uh, what ship do you want? There were half a dozen ships, they'd pick one, because th they were losing all their seagoing officers. Mm. So I, 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 picked, uh, I picked one of them, the Thurston. So he says, why'd you pick the Thurston? I said, I know the ship. She was with me in the Atlantic. She's with me in the Pacific. I know the ship. I didn't tell him it was the last one due in. And uh, she wasn't due in till December 30th. So they gave me orders to, to report to the Thurston on De uh, December 31st. I said, now I've got three weeks. What am I going to do? Let me go home. My first family had moved to Philadelphia. They said, go home. So I went to Philadelphia. Okay. Then I looked at my orders. No naval or or officer is ever ordered directly to a ship. He is ordered to a port for further transportation to a ship. I was ordered directly to the ship. I don't know where the ship is. So I, I had my orders, my flight, my, my flight ticket to get back to California. But I walked into the Philadelphia Navy Yard. I said, I'm reporting for duty for the USS Thurston. He says, she's not here. I says, how do I know that? He looked at me and he says, oh, you, th you think you're going to get away with that? I said, you tell me. I said, look, I've been through enough. I says, can I get I'm reporting for duty. He said, you know, it's New Year's Eve. I can't, nobody in Washington is even going to know wh is, where, where the damn Thurston is or where anything else is. The war is over, New Year's Eve. He said, go on home and call me every day. In March, they released me from duty while I, from, while I was at home. So what happened to you after the war? After the war, I, went, I joined my dad, and we went out as a salesman on the road. I was selling Vince clothing, and I got tired of that. And we, I was away from home too much, so I got myself a job with a clothing, with a retail store in Chattanooga. And we moved to Chattanooga, my wife and I. I, kept, I met my wife. Uh, the fifth day I ever saw my wife was the day we were married. Ooh. And uh, in April, we'll celebrate our 55th anniversary. Congratulations. But uh, the, uh, after Chattanooga, I moved back up and went into the department store business. And uh, the uh, president of Sirocco, up here in Baldwinsville, I was buying Sirocco merchandise. He liked me, hired me as the national sales manager. I moved to Baldwinsville. And I stayed at Sirocco till I retired in 1980. And since then, for well, 10 or a dozen years, I did went back on the road on my own. And since then, I've just sort of done whatever I feel like doing. Good. Any kids, grandkids? I have t uh, two boys and uh, two granddaughters who are in co one of them is in graduate school, the other one is just in, in college. When you look back at your wartime experiences now, anything in particular stand out, very vivid? The, the most vivid thing that stands out is my love for the Charles Carroll. I, 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 I think of her all the time. She was a good ship, she saved my life, took me places, and I have, I have a, a tremendous amount of love for that ship, that's hard. To, anyone who has never been through that kind of an experience is, would be hard to understand. What happened to the ship? She went into mothballs up in up in the area, the Bay Area, and I understand in 1957 was scrapped. Did we get together with any of your old shipmates? Oh yes, we have annual reunions. Uh, I did not, I've been to a couple of them. I missed the last one, uh, but uh, we keep in touch. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, what do we do?
give a shot. Oh, yeah, sure you can do that. Here's a, this, I'm very proud of this picture from uh, Ernie Pyle and myself. He's probably the most famous war correspondent of World War II. And we got to know each other very well. The little thing up on the bottom is a copy of his gravestone in, a, in Hawaii. I took that picture of him. Good. Thank you. And there's my, my hat from my reunions. Oh. APA 28, huh? APA 28, USS Charles Garrett. All set? Yeah, yeah sir. we have to do a little paperwork here. All right. Is there any possibility of you ever seeing?